thank you all for coming. Appreciate uh, you making the time to come here. Uh, today I'm, like I say, going to speak a little bit about, um, it's titled Cycle Like a Pro. So um, as a personal trainer, a cycling coach, as well as a, in a cycle a racer, um, recently California state champion in the criterium for both masters and the elite, as well as fourth at nationals. Um, just going to share some of the uh, techniques that I have used that both myself and that I share with my uh, clients and athletes that I coach. So I just want to get a sense of, uh, if we get started, um, your experience a little bit on how much riding um, you do if you're if you do much at all. So um, if we look at you know zero to thirty miles a week, are we in that category or over that? So around that, that amount, okay, okay. Um, another question, I guess, what are a few of the key, and you're, and you're welcome to tone in as, uh, you know, chip in here. What are some of the key components you feel are important to be um, a successful cyclist? Well, one thing is posture. Posture? On the bike. Okay. I'm talking about it. Great. Good, yep, definitely. Anybody else? So the idea, like Sarah, is successful being faster. How do you get faster on the bike? What do you think are some of the key components of that? Endurance, building up your strength. Yep, Biking. building up your endurance. <laughs> yep, that's great. Muscle Any other? Power. Muscle, yes, muscle power, exactly. Yeah, technique. Technique, excellent, yeah. And tonight I'm gonna you know, incorporate a lot of those. Um, uh, and what I'm gonna get started, uh, before I get into the kind of three main things I'm gonna talk about is, I was listening to a podcast the other day and it was a, it's called The Kick-Ass Life by David Wood. It's a great one to uh, put down if you're looking for some motivation. And he had there, he was interviewing a gentleman who had authored a book on interviewing a hundred of the, one of the top really successful people in the world. And based on all those interviews, he came up with a, an equation for success, this author. And I'm just going to share with that a little bit of, share with you now what that is because it's a component of what I'm going to share, talk with tonight um, is related to that. So the equation for success that this gentleman from interviewing these top 100 successful people uh, came was P plus T times A squared plus F. And that equaled success. Now P stand for passion, that internal desire to want to do something. T stood for talent. You needed to have some sort of talent in that field that you've chose, whether it's natural or developed. A, notice the multiplication, these two are important, it's A squared. A is action, and the second A is association. Association. So action, practice, basically. Association, being around other successful people. And then F, finally, is fate, that internal belief. So putting all those components together with a multiplication here, these two are definitely important. Putting action and being around other successful people are very important. And as a coach, those are also some of the key components that I factor in, especially action. When I'm coaching somebody to get better in cycling, I'm giving them specific tasks in order to do, to practice in order to get better. And that's where it leads into my three, um, three main points I'm gonna to talk to you tonight. Stress, recovery, and bike handling skills. Um, stress and recovery go hand in hand. You think of anything, you go into the gym, you wanna build muscle, stressing the muscles, Going and resting, recovering, they get bigger. You want to get better at something on a, you know, reading a book, the mind gets working, you rest, go for sleep, next thing, you know, all the information gets absorbed and you get better. So with, with, with in the pro, my, when I'm um, outlining a program for my clients, the, there are four components to stress that I focus on in order that they can focus, that, in order to stress their body. First is resistance, then aerobic endurance, SMSP, super maximal sustainable power, and the fourth is maximal sustainable power. So the first resistance training, this is going to weight training. 
It's essentially going to the gym working the main muscles that propel you in cycling, being your uh, legs and core. Um, in that resistance phase, there's kind of three micro phases. We have a hypertrophy stage which builds the muscles. We have a strength phase which strengthens it, and then a power to get that you know more speed. Uh, I look at the resistance phase as similar to like a tree, like growing your roots. A tree with really strong roots is going to last a long time. Same thing in cycling. It's in order, typically in a race, the person that produces the highest average power over the dur duration of the uh, race uh, usually comes out ahead. Now power is a form of speed and force and speed. And to generate force and speed you need some good strong muscle development. So I work through those three microcycles in the resistance phase in order to strengthen the roots of your system. The next I work on is the aerobic endurance and I look at this as almost like the, the stem of the tree. It's your body's ability to take in oxygen, utilize it, give it to the muscles in order for the muscles which you just developed in the gym through weight training to put the power to the pedals so you can become faster on it. Uh, typically the aerobic endurance phase, it consists of longer rides at a lower intensity. This just allows the systems in your body um, to take in the oxygen and become more efficient at getting it out to, to your muscles. The next one is super maximal sustainable power. Uh, this is a phase which um, is characterized by very high intensity and much lower volume. And this is one of the more critical stages and it builds your cycling specific power. So we've gone to the, you know, we've done the resistance training, build our muscle development. Then we've gone and built our aerobic base, and now we're building that cycling specific power on the bike to get you going fast. <clears throat> Once that's done, we move to maximal sustainable power. And that is a phase that consists of more, um, it's higher intensity, but the intervals, um, I didn't mention, the intervals in the, this stage three are kind of one to four minutes, just to give you an idea. Then as we stretch out to maximal sustainable power, it's more like 8 to 20 minutes. So we built up that cycling specific power in the SMSP, and now we're putting that over out over a longer duration of time, being able to build, build that capacity to withstand that over a longer duration. So that is you know, stress, the four phases to kind of work through when I'm working with an athlete. Next is recovery. Uh, this is something that I, I mean, they definitely go hand in hand. And it's, I almost, I focus a lot of times I can give somebody the um, plan to go stress their body. The ability to recover, that's how you make your next step up in improvements. And a lot of people don't always put that together. So that's, you know, something I'm able to come on board and really help them with. And there's a few key components to that. Hydration and nutrition, sleep, and stress management. Um, so when uh, hydration and nutrition, this happens both on the bike and after the bike. Uh, when you're actually out riding or doing any physical activity, what you're taking in at, at that time is going to help your recovery afterwards. A lot of people think, you know, they're. Uh, uh, they don't do a lot during the exercise and then after their routine isn't as key and then they just don't have the optimal recovery. Um, the hydration, obviously water is very, you know, basic hydration needs of our body. Our body's made of what percentage of water? I mean, it's 70, 80 for 80 percent, I think. Um, so that's very key what your body needs to, to be able to help recovery. Then with the nutrition, a um, few key components is protein and carbohydrates. And the actual timing of those is also really helps to enhance recovery. Uh, protein, it's uh, more and more research is showing that there's a 30 minute window after you have exercised when, and, and stressed your body and, and, and damaged your muscle tissues essentially, 
that protein, that 30 minute window, is most effective in order to get back into your muscles and recover the damaged. Carbohydrates, um, it's more, you know, from when you're done your exercise up to possibly eight hours is the time frame you're recovering along that whole time. And that depending on the intensity and duration of, the, of, your, of your workout. If you do a long workout really intense and you really stress the body, your body's going to, you know, you, and utilize a lot of the carbohydrates, the, the glycogen in the muscles, um, it, it'll take that time to, to get fully restored. Uh, antioxidants is another important aspect of helping. When you exercise, your body produces free radicals. Um, and being able to um, fight these free radicals, um, antioxidants is one very important aspect component of that um, can get in a number of forms. I mean fruit, blueberries, raspberries, high in antioxidants. Uh, the timing of that for recent, a lot of people, um, more and more research has come out that it's actually better to wait to have your antioxidants kind of three hours after your exercise as opposed to right after. Right after you is when the protein and carbohydrates get absorbed then the antioxidants to break down the free radicals more like three hours and after is more effective in the recovery. Uh, the second uh, aspect of recovery is sleep. I mean, we all know how important sleep is, or in some, a lot of us struggle with sleep. Some people are pretty good with sleep, and there's an, uh, there's certain a couple things. I mean, the important aspect of sleep is your time before midnight. The, 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 you know, it's said that in every hour before midnight of sleep is equates to the equal to almost two hours after midnight. So, be going to bed at like say nine or ten, much more you'll have a much more better, you know, sounder sleep, be able to recover than say you go to bed at twelve or midnight or twelve or one a.m. Um, uh, sometimes I, you know, some of my clients that struggle with sleep, uh, we work a bit on visualization, relaxation techniques. That's a whole other topic, but that is something if people struggle with sleep, to you know, their mind is extremely you know strong. You know they say you believe. You know be careful what you you believe, right? Or what you believe you will create. And it's just that that same notion of um, being able to get in a relaxed state and turn your mind off and allow it to rest, so you can go to sleep. Um, it definitely it takes practice, but it's uh, something that is effective. And then finally, stress management. We talked a lot about stress so far, um, you know, mentally and physically. We're in a society that is definitely, you know, we're time strapped, you know, financially strapped. You know, there's a lot of components there that bring stress on. And I can say there's certain components to work with, uh, with some of my, you know, with clients, whether it's the sleep, what the antioxidants, using some nutritional supplement products to help give that body the extra minerals, trace minerals, nutrients that it needs in order to manage the stress that you've built up. Uh, so those are the first stress recovery. The third thing that we just want to cover is bike handling skills. Um, I think that was uh, technique was mentioned at the beginning when we were talking about you know effective how to get better on the bike. I mean that that is a component of it, um, but definitely when you're out on the road with other traffic, with other riders, your bike handling skills is very important. Uh, something that's definitely key is communication with traffic, with other riders. I usually incorporate some clinics, one-on-one -on -one sessions with some of my clients that I don't feel comfortable with descending, cornering, um, in traffic, using communication, whether it's their voice, whether it's using hand signals. There is some etiquette out there on the road when you're biking that it's very important they follow and by following that you'll be respected more as a cyclist through traffic by, the, by those driving and vice versa. Uh, just see. <clears throat> and that's, um, that's you know, mainly the, the three topics that I just wanted to cover and you know just in conclusion just want to go back to this, this uh, you know, formula of success where you know whenever you're thinking you know anything that you do and you want to you know achieve some sort of success on it 
this is a, I found a really good formula that if you have the passion and desire inside, you have some type of talent which also can also be developed. You practice, you surround yourself with other successful people in that field you're trying to be successful, you know, you're trying to achieve success, and then you have the internal, the fate, the belief inside. Um, it's usually a very good formula for getting what, you know, achieving success. And I use the same for cycling and the clients that I work with. So, thank you very much. Uh, that's, uh, I'm going to let Dylan take it over. He's going to be talking about bike fit. And uh, today we're going to be talking about um, getting you on a bike and making sure that that bike is the right bike for you and also, you know, taking into account your injuries and any kind of uh, limitations and uh, weaknesses that you may have, tight muscles. Um, so we'll take it from more the medical perspective. You can get your bike fit uh, here in Mill Valley. It's kind of uh, quite a nexus of uh, crazy cyclists, enthusiasts, and you know, there's a, the whole gamut of um, you know going to a bike shop and having some guy say, oh, you know, you look like you're about 5'10. I'm going to give you this bike. To places down the street where you know you can get on a kind of a simulator and they can take every angle, every measurement from chest to femur to tibia. And that whole cycling, you know, cycling fit session can you know take four or five hours. Um, so in, in kind of choosing what route you want to go, you want to think about what kind of rider are you. There's no real point in getting that you know super pro cycling fit and getting your bike fit to be a pro racer if you're not going out you know a couple times a week and you don't have the time and and um, organization in your life to to commit to getting in shape and using your bike. Uh, so, you know, if you fit yourself for a bike that's really aggressive, uh, but you have tight hips, or you just don't have the cardiovascular endurance to be out there, you know, don't have the power in your legs to, to take advantage of it, you're just going to come back with more injuries, and you're doing yourself more harm than good. Uh, so when you come to a physical therapist versus, you know, maybe a bike shop, uh, you're going to get someone with more of a medical perspective. So if you have a history of injuries, um, where you just want to want to know how to prevent them, if you you know looking to get both sides of the coin, uh, that's why you would come to a physical therapist for a bike fit. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to talk personally here about kind of my own experience getting my bike fit. I had a bike custom built, and I went to a bike shop, and um, you know they were great in that they took a really thorough approach, and they they were really specific and wanted to make sure they wanted to know what kind of rider I was, whether I was into touring or. Uh, mountain biking or road biking, and uh, they, they took a lot of measurements, but they really didn't know what to do with a lot of those measurements. And, you know, in the end, they kind of gave me some shims for my shoes a little bit, and they, they set up the bike pretty well, but then in the end, uh, they put the shims the wrong direction. So, um, you want to always listen to your body, and when you go in and uh, get fit for something, never let anyone tell you that, you know, it's going to take a few weeks to wean into it, or you know, if it doesn't feel right, pretty, pretty close to right away, you know, check in with them and, and listen to your body. Alright, so now we're going to kind of walk through just general concepts of how to fit your bike to your body. The first thing you want to do is make sure you've got the right frame size, because that's the, the meat of the bike and you can't change it once you've kind of purchased your frame. It's uh, kind of a big step to go back on. Um, and Dan, why don't you come over here? I'm just going to have you be my uh, dummy for the day. This is Dana's bike. And if you take your shoes off. So generally we would want to have uh, someone dressed and ready to cycle, wearing their spandex or whatever they like to ride in, and wearing, you know, having their cycling shoes available, their cleats. Um, so first you would take their inseam measurements. And like I said, you know, at a pro bike shop, they might take tons of different measurements. This is just one, you know, what I usually do to get a general idea. There's obviously a lot further you can go with this. So I take the inseam by giving you the zero here on that uh, scale. We do everything in centimeters metric. I think that's a little more official. Dana's from Canada, he'll understand. <laughs> so you put that all the way up in there and compress the soft tissue in your groin to put it right on the perineum. Right? That's right between the genitals and the anus. Right. And you want to compress it Check. about... Yeah, good. Check. <laughs> <laughs> you want to compress it about as much as you would you know, sitting, sitting on the bike. Yep. All right. So I'm gonna take it down to the floor and put your feet maybe a little closer together. There you go. So maybe eight inches, six inches apart. Okay, <laughs> so now we're looking at 
85 and a half centimeters. Right? I know it sounds familiar. I'm sure you've had this done a couple times. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, the equation is you take that and you multiply it <coughs> by 0. 0.65, and this is going off the Le Mans, Greg Le Mans kind of bike fitting. Um, and you would get a uh, number, and that would be your frame size. you remember what the... Uh, you know, 50, uh, 54. I mean, 55, it might be. I usually write a little smaller, so... Okay. Yeah, so... F this is 55. I don't have a calculator on me. No. But um, basically, you would get a general frame size. And then, you know, back in the day, that would just... You'd get that number, and you would measure from the center of the bottom bracket up to the top tube here, where the top tube intersects with the seat tube. And that would be your frame size, and that would match up. These days, unfortunately, or fortunately for, for performance, um, bike geometry has become a lot more complicated and a lot more custom. So if someone has a longer torso, uh, shorter legs, you know, they can, you can kind of tweak your bike and, and look into different bike manufacturers and find one that really specifically gets your body geometry and uh, incorporates into the frame geometry. Um, <clears throat> but in general, uh, that can give us a, a good sense on what size frame to get you. And then from there, we would look at um, a measurement from your greater trochanter, which is the most lateral part of your femur here. And we would measure that to the floor. So I'm going to have you stand facing the camera and kind of, uh, again, hips and feet lined up there. And I'm going to find that bone out here. And I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Good, and you, if you can't find it, you might want to have someone turn their toe in or out a little bit, so wiggle around and find the most prominent part of that and stop. Good, okay. There you go, the floor, and that is 87 and a half centimeters. So you take that number and multiply that by 1.85, and that gives you a sense of what the crank length should be. Um, so most bike shops will sell you a bike, you know, the stock componentry will, you know, maybe the crank arm lengths will be 170s or 160s. Uh, there's not a lot of variation in that. Um, but if you're, you know, kind of significantly off that, uh, you're going to want to really change those cranks out so that you get the right size crank arm. All right, and the general range is about 150 to 180, what they can do. And what is the measurement of crank arm? So we're going... <clears throat> from here to the center of the center. Of the center. Yeah, and it usually says on the crank arms, so you got 172.5 here. Yeah. Good. Typically, 172.5. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so having that crank arm custom uh, really means that you're going to get the most um, power transfer with every pedal. If your crank arms are too long, you know, that's good. It'll give you more power, but you're losing efficiency. So when you're going fast um, on flats, you want to have the you know, right distance. You're going to waste a lot of energy doing too much of this. Uh, but on the same token, if you're hitting some hills, um, you want to make sure that your crank arms are not too short, because greater leverage there, lever arm, will give you more power on those hills. Uh, and then, you know, that's also something we should mention. If you plan to do a lot of hills and you love to have that power and you're, you know, don't have a lot of time to train, and the one thing that's important to you is just getting up those hills and feeling good, um, maybe you do want a longer than average crank arm. So it's you know, perfectly fine to change that a little bit if you want. I question, yeah. the formula doesn't make sense to me. It says the greater cro uh, crocanter to floor times 1.85? Yeah. That would be a huge number. Yeah, and then you transfer the millimeters. Yeah, so these so, measurements are taken in millimeters. Oh, so, right. so, yeah, yeah. Okay. 172 millimeters, 172.5 millimeters. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's what my opinion. Okay. So that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we're looking at the saddle height. So now's a good time to get your shoes back on, even though they're not the perfect uh, cycling mm -hmm. shoes. And we get you on the bike, Dana. And I'm just going to have the cyclist do a couple revolutions here, get comfortable on the bike. And don't try to do anything that feels unnatural yet. Okay, and then take a break. And <clears throat> we want to stop with the, uh, the right foot 
in the down position here. I'm going to go grab something. I'll be right back. So we want the right foot down, and I'm going to have the uh, crank arm pretty much in line with that C2. And there may be some variations on how people do this, but this is how I like to do it. And then drop the heel um, a little bit below the forefoot here. So let's say we're right about there. Good. And that's changing over the years. You know, some people uh, really like to drive with their toe, but you know, unless you're doing track cycling, you're going to have that, um, you're going to drive more with the heel nowadays. They're advising less to drive with the toe. So I'm going to find the greater trochanter again. I'm going to find the center of the knee axis. And I'm going to follow that down to the lateral malleolus. And this is all good physical therapy speak. Um, <laughs> but if anyone has any questions, just let me know. <laughs> and you find an angle there. And he's at about 18. Okay? Maybe a little more towards 20 if I kind of get more of a feel for it where the knee axis was. Good. And uh, that's actually pretty good. I would say you want to be from about 20 to 25 degrees. And is that usually the height you ride at? Yeah. Okay. Do you have that pretty dialed in in a certain way? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Shoe. Right, right. <laughs> so the shoe factor. Um, cool. And if you're having pain in your knee and you know, you're curious about whether you need to change the seat height, um, if you have knee pain generally, maybe you should think about raising the seat up a little bit because the, the more bend in your knee throughout the cycle, the more compression on your patellofemoral joint. And on the other side of the coin, if you're having back pain, that might mean that your seat is too high. And to get your leg around, you kind of have to over flex your lumbar spine. So if you're having back pain, you might want to lower the seat down a little bit. All right, you can get off the, well, let's see. Uh, stay there for a second. Okay, so the next one we're going to look at is deciding how to move your seat forward and back to so the fore and aft position of the saddle. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, good idea. Get you a little more oriented to the camera. Okay, so hop back on the bike. And then we're going to bring the feet in the horizontal, uh, this right foot forward, so the crank arms are horizontal. Good. Thank you. And then it's good to have a plumb line, but this little tape measure kind of accomplishes that. So I'm going to measure from the front of the knee here in the patellar tendon. And just let that hang down. And you want to look at the pedal axle. And in general, you want that line to be pretty close to the pedal axle. Um, and this is a little bit behind it, a couple centimeters behind it. Um, so if it's behind it a little bit, that's fine. But a couple centimeters is probably more than I would recommend. So uh, that's good for his knees. Like, like cleats, you know. Oh, right, right. He's not wearing cleats. It's yeah. <laughs> cleat position, right? If I was clipped in. Right, right. So your cleat position, yeah, I, I would put, I would wear your cleats, so put your foot forward a little more. So that's where I would put your cleats on your shoe. Let's remeasure that. And that's much better. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, but if your knee is too far forward over that pedal axle, you're going to, again, have too much bend in your knee during the revolutions, and that's going to compress the patellofemoral joint. Too far back, and you're not going to get the power you're looking for. All right, so now let's go in, uh, more to the upper body. So now we're thinking about, you know, do you have neck pain? Do you have shoulder pain, elbow, tendonitis, forearm problems, carpal tunnel? All these problems can be you know, exacerbated if your handlebar setup is not right. So, um, again, get uh, kind of in the saddle there, Dana. Um, in general, a good 45 degree angle is good. And of course, if you're more of a uh, performance cyclist and you're doing more sprint stuff, track cyclist, you're going to be down lower and you're going to be beyond that 45 degree angle. Uh, so if you're in the drops there, Dana, 
you know, he's definitely below that 45 degree angle. But if he's up on the hoods, he's pretty close to that. And that's just a you know general gross measurement for the average comfort cyclist. Um, you don't want to be anywhere you know near that 45. You want to be up a little bit above 45 degrees. Um, and let's think about the stem length. So um, <clears throat> if you can look down and you cannot see the hub because the handlebar is blocking that view. What's that? Oh, sorry. Good point. Um, yeah, so if you cannot see the axle uh, because the, his eyes are kind of being blocked by the handlebar, then that's a good position. So what are you getting there? Yeah, it's not good. I can't see that. Can't see it. Perfect. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then the other gross measurement is get off the bike. Maybe have their elbow at the front of the saddle, kind of pointing forward. Go ahead and do that for me, Dana. Sorry, what do you want? So put your elbow at the front of the saddle and see how um, far away your fingers are. Good. You want to be, you know, pretty close to that fork right there, okay? The headset. All right, Dana, can you walk around the other way just to, um, sure. to the other side of the bike so we sure. can see the camera? Sorry, and that's kind I'm of really, a, what are you looking for? We're looking the, that the tip of the fingers yeah. are, you know, pretty close to that handlebar and right around the headset. Center, like that. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, but again, that's these are pretty gross measurements. All right. Um, and if you're having neck and arm problems, you want to bring that a little bit closer and get a shorter stem. So that's something that you can really easily switch out. And then the other thing is with handlebars, uh, you want to make sure that you get the right size handlebar. Um, you know, these are, I think, are they regular size drops or smaller? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. On my bike, I'm definitely a shorter, I'm 5'5", five five, so I bought, you know, the smaller handlebars that just bring this up half an inch or an inch. So, you know, there are options out there. Not everyone knows this when, when you go to buy your bike and uh, you can get smaller or larger handlebars based on your size. And when they sell you a you know, stock bike, they're not necessarily going to worry about that. So if you get on your bike and going down to the drops feels like you're breaching forever and it hurts your lower back because you're too forward flexed, then, you know, think about changing that handlebar out. All right? Um, and then there are other things you can change with the, the brakes and, um, and making sure everything's adjusted. And just, it's a good point to mention, um, you want to keep your bike well tuned up, too. You could have it totally fit, but then all of a sudden it's been three years and you've been riding in an area where there's some heavy sand or dirt, and now your cables are all gunked up. And it takes a lot of force to pull those brakes. So maybe you're having, you know, flexor tendonitis because you just need new cables and new housing. So, you know, be on top of that and take your bike to a regular mechanic. Um, every six months to a month, and you know, just be on top of your, your tune-ups if you're, if you're feeling anything. Okay, uh, let's move on to a couple case studies. Anyone have questions so far? No? First of all, one of the you know, weird case studies I saw was someone with, uh, with knee pain on one side, and it was a side that they would mount their bike with. So, you know, we all generally live in as asymmetrical life, and you're know, probably always going to mount and dismount from the same side of your bike. So if you're having pain on your left IT band and you're always going on and off like that, you know, maybe it's from that motion. And if you're you know, getting on and off your bike a lot because you're riding in heavy traffic, that's something you want to address. So maybe you want to switch it up and get on the bike from the other side. Um, and in general, cycling doesn't really strengthen any lateral muscles. It's a, a sport that you get a lot of mileage out of your quads and your glutes, but you never really work the abductors and lateral hip muscles. So um, in addressing some of these knee pain issues, um, you want to kind of cross train a little bit and do some exercises that strengthen your abductors. So I've got a little picture there of the gluteus medius. That's the most important powerful abductor. And the hip external rotators are another one. And this is where you've got to kind of, you know, skirt the balance between performance and help, and ask yourself, you know, the, I think there's a technique, Dana, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that you're trained to like take your knee in sometimes when you want a little extra power in the downstroke. Is that right? For some people. Some people. But it's one of those things we often do yeah. intuitively too, right? Yeah, yeah. 
and, and that's great for that little extra burst of power, but if you're doing that all day long on your whole ride, and you're constantly like knee in, toe in, um, that's going to put increased load and stretch on your IT band. And that'll stretch that AT band across um, the hip, so you might get hip bursitis too. Um, so if you've got tight IT bands, number one, you want to roll them out on a foam roller. Number two, you want to strengthen the muscles that take the load off the IT band. The old way was to always think foam roller, but now we're starting to think, you know, maybe there are um, reasons why this keeps getting tight, and maybe just foam rollering is not going to address the problem. Uh, but still, we'll show you that today. So, loosen up your IT bands, you want to get on a foam roller, line your side, and work it all the way from the top of the hip, down to the knee, and maybe down on your elbow. If you're able to keep a neutral lumbar spine, that's probably going to be better for your back and walk with your hands, rather than like, you don't want to be torquing back and forth like that too much if you have a bad back. I have a question. Yeah. How about those rollers that yeah. have the little, you know, people? Those are great. Yeah, so the stick, also a medicine ball um, can be helpful. So if you can feel and you know that it's just really this one spot right down here, you might want to get down on a medicine ball and work that specifically. Or a tennis ball. Yeah, tennis ball, golf ball. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, the other idea is that you're not getting any better because the muscles underneath the IT band, the external rotators and abductors, are so weak that you're left with no choice but to use your IT band all day long. So you want to strengthen the abductors. And let's bring this mat against the wall and do some external rotation, a little clamshell motion. And I like to use the wall as a cue so you know where vertical is. So you scoot the bottom hip against the wall, you take the top hip away from the wall a little bit, and then get that rotation going. And when that starts to feel boring, then you can put some weights or put a TheraBand around your knees to add some resistance. And then open that same position. The other muscle group is your gluteus medius. And sliding up the wall, kicking up and back, even holding it and pressing back into the wall will fire up these muscles. Um, but if you're doing these and you kick up and forward a little bit, you might be activating the wrong muscle. <clears throat> On that uh, diagram here, talk about the tensor fascia lata, that is the muscle that feeds into the IT band. So if you're doing your abduction and you go forward a little bit, you're really just worsening the problem because you're strengthening the muscle that feeds into the IT band. So having a stronger TFL is not going to help take the pressure off your IT band, it's going to add to it. All right, and then uh, another fav favorite one of mine is the clamshell, or the uh, crab walk. So we put the band around the knees. You've got to have cool socks when you do it. <laughs> I'm going to get down into a squat, and go side to side. Make sure you're getting that external rotation and abduction out of your hips when you're doing it. Uh, and then one other thing that's useful to mention here is the, the QL, the quadratus lumborum. So with every cycling downstroke and upstroke, you want that pelvic stability so that your force is transferred directly into your glutes and your quads. Um, and if you have a stable core and back, you'll get that. If you're watching someone on the bike and their hips are all over the place, um, maybe it's sexy, but it doesn't do so well for your lumbar spine, and doesn't do so well for your power. So, <clears throat> good old-fashioned side plank. You do it with uh, straight legs up here, or bent knees if you're just getting started. This is a good way to strengthen the quadratus lumborum and part of the core. All right. Any questions on that? 
Yeah? How are we doing on time? Got a few minutes to talk about neck pain? All right. So on the bike, obviously, um, you're tucked, especially in road cycling, and you're going to have some hyperextension in your neck. So, you know, we're not expecting your posture to be perfect all day long, but you want to at least know what the proper position is so you can get into that position whenever you think of it and have the strength to get yourself there and stay there as long as you can. Um, so the muscle that keeps you in that chin tuck, and when you do that chin tuck, it opens up the back of the neck and kind of gaps and leaves some breathing room around there for your vertebrae and your nerves as they come out. Um, you want to have a strong longus coli, and that is basically the core of the neck. So you've got deep abdominal muscles here to stabilize your lumbar spine. You've also got deep neck flexors to stabilize your cervical spine. And the simplest way to strengthen your longus coli is with the chin tuck. It's probably the most boring of any physical therapy exercise, but it's also pretty useful. And you tuck your chin, nod like you're saying yes, and hold it for five or ten seconds. And make sure to keep breathing and tucking. And you know, sometimes I do it with a towel behind the neck. And this is one of those uh, less is more things. So don't over muscle it. If you feel like all the neck muscles in the front are clenching and you can palpate them and they feel like they're engaging, you're doing too much. So go subtle on your chin tucks. All right? Um, and then a few more exercises to kind of train your neck and to counterbalance all the, you know, the bad stuff you do to your neck and back while you're on the bike. Uh, my favorite is the Sphinx on your elbows. So if you think about cycling your forward bent a lot, here you're doing a back bend, but it's not as aggressive as a cobra that you would do in yoga. So you pull back on the elbows, you lift the sternum, but you keep the chin tucked. You activate your scapular stabilizers, and your longest coli while you're there, okay? And then you want to make sure your elbows aren't too wide or you want to get them right underneath your shoulder joint and pull back and hold it for maybe 10 seconds, looking down at your thumbs, not up here, because that's what you do on the bike. So no need to do more of that in your exercise routine. Okay. Um, and then one more thing for strengthening some of the back muscles because on the bike you're working your pecs a lot and you're forward rounded so in your exercise routine you want to counterbalance that by strengthening the scapular retractors. So I get on the ball and do like an I or T, I, T and a Y. So come down here, get the ball under your pelvis and find as neutral of a position as you can. Bring the arms back for the eye. Out to the side for the T. And in front for the Y. And if you'll notice, on the T and the Y, I'm doing external rotation. That's kind of important for the, uh, for the engagement of the proper middle and lower trapezius. When you're in internal rotation, that gets your rhomboids. And most people have pretty tight rhomboids. So external rotation quiets the rhomboids and gets the middle and lower traps, which are often neglected. So you're doing the T's and the Y's. And you're pulling the shoulder blades away from the ears when you go forward. OK? So having a litany of strengthening and stretches to counterbalance and kind of cross-train for your bike routine is pretty important. Kind of keep away neck pain, keep away knee pain. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you again, Dylan Bartley from Ackerman Physical Therapy and Dana Williams from Achieve. Achieve, sorry. Right. Achieve and Ackerman Physical Therapy. Yeah. yeah, high performance coaching. So if you need to reach us, um, these will be, this will be posted on
both Dana's site at Achieve and at Active Marin's website. So for those of us who couldn't make it um, or need review, we can go onto our sites. And um, what is your site, Dana? Achieve PTC stands for Performance Training and Coaching. Dot com. Okay, and we're Dylan's ActiveMarin.com. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you guys.